And Lord, how thankful we are for your endless, boundless love. Lord, a love that was demonstrated on Calvary's cross for each and every one of us. A love that we can never repay. A love that, Lord, we simply receive. And a love that we hope would flow through us and minister to the hearts of others. And Lord, we do thank you for that great love. Lord, what else can we do? How else could we respond but to come and gather as the Ohana, the family, turning our hearts and minds in worship and praise unto you. So Lord, bless our time we pray. In Jesus' name we ask, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen, amen and Amen. Please be seated. Well, today we have a very special Mother's Day message in store. Uh, so let's open our Bibles to John chapter 16. <laughs> no, really, there's a Mother's Day message in there. We're going to see that as we go through our text today. Now, you recall that in this upper room discourse, John chapters 14 through 17, we mentioned that in chapter 14, verse 31, Jesus and the disciples left the upper room, no doubt traversing across the Temple Mount, heading to the Kidron Valley, according to chapter 18, to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And on the way, Jesus was instructing and ministering to them in a variety of ways. In chapter 15, he told them how important it was they abide in him, as well as the persecution that'll come because of him. And then in chapter 16, in the first 15 verses, what we looked at last time we were together, Jesus did two things. First of all, he gave them a reason for teaching them. Second, he gave them a reason for leaving them. Now, the reason for teaching them is so they wouldn't stumble because of the persecution of their faith, as well as to help them to remember that Jesus said persecution and trials will indeed come. But in leaving them, Jesus said it was important that he do that because if he didn't leave, the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. Now, that brings us to verse 16 of John chapter 16 and our study for today. So let's pick up our reading in John 16:16, 16, 16, reading down through verse 33, the end of the chapter. John chapter 16, verse 16. A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Well, then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. Well, they said therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Now, most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being is born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. <laughs> Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Now, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Now, in that day... You will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, 
and have believed that I came forth from God. I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. <laughs> Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Well, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, and has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Now these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Now in the balance of John chapter 16, Jesus deals with three issues. We've divided our text into three very simple sections if you're taking notes or outlining our study today. The first section involves the problem of the disciples. The problem of the disciples. That's in verses 16 through 19. Now while it's true the disciples were a bunch of knuckleheads and they had a lot of problems, the specific problem that's mentioned here points to a lack of understanding. A lack of understanding as it pertains to what Jesus was telling them. And we would mention three things in this first section dealing with the problem of the disciples. Number one, the first thing involves the statement to the disciples. The statement to the disciples. Uh, drop back to verse 16 again. In John 16, 16, Jesus makes a rather interesting statement. He says, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Now this statement for the disciples is interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, because of the words that are used. Twice in verse 16, Jesus uses the word see. In a little while you will not see me, and again in a little while you will see me. But what makes this interesting is both of these words are totally different words. The first word for see when they will not see him is the word theoreo. It's our English word for theater. It speaks of being a spectator, standing off at a distance and gazing upon or looking at something or someone as you would in a theater looking down at a production. But the second word that's used here is the word opta nomai. We could almost speak it into English. It's our English word optometry. It carries the idea of seeing clearly we might say putting on a pair of glasses so everything comes into perfect focus. And thus when you see something clearly, you have a solid understanding of what you're seeing. That's the second word for see that's being used. <laughs> you know, I'll never forget when our first son Bradley was growing up, he was always moved to the front of the class. Now, he could never sit still in class. He was a fidgeter. He was moving. He was antsy. He couldn't sit still. He was always blurting out and dropping things and falling out of his chair. And, and craziest thing ever, they always moved him right to the front of the class. And we assumed it's because he was always in trouble. One day, we took him to the eye doctor. Turned out he was blind as a bat. He couldn't see anything. And we got him a pair of glasses. And I'll never forget, as we were driving him home, he looked out the window and said, wow. I never knew those bumps on the telephone lines were birds. And Sally and I looked at each other and said, we are terrible parents. <laughs> But man, everything was brought into focus for him. He could now see clearly and have understanding of what he was looking at. That's the second word for see that's being used here. And the reason that becomes so significant is because of the interpretation of verse 16. 
Now we must say that good scholars have different views as to what Jesus is referring to in this statement to the disciples. There are three major views that scholars hold. View number one is that Jesus is referring to his ascension and his second coming. Because at his ascension, they will not see him after he ascends into heaven. They will no longer be able to look and gaze upon him. But at his second coming, everybody is going to clearly see him and have absolute understanding as to why he's coming back to earth on that white horse with a sword as he begins to judge the nations in Matthew 25, 32. That's view number one. View number two is that he's talking about his ascension and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus ascends into heaven, they will not see him. But in a little while, they will see him in the person of the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon them in Acts chapter 2, their spiritual eyes are now opened and they can see clearly and understand spiritual truths. That's view number two. View number three, and probably the correct view, is that he is talking about his death and resurrection. Because when Jesus dies, they will no longer see him. But when he is resurrected, they will see him with great clarity and have understanding that what he said to them regarding the resurrection will indeed be true. You say, but wasn't great understanding given to them at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon them? Wouldn't the second view seem to fit better in light of these Greek words? The word optonomai, having clarity of vision? Oh, didn't the Holy Spirit come to the disciples before the day of Pentecost? Yes. In fact, in Acts chapter 20, verse 22, at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. So it would seem that his death and resurrection really fit the totality of the statement that's being made here. But whatever view you hold to, the point here is simple. The disciples had a problem and it was a lack of understanding. Back to John chapter 16. Let's come to the second thing we want to look at. Number one, a statement to the disciples. The second thing involves a lack of understanding by the disciples. A lack of understanding by the disciples. Uh, look at verses 17 and 18. In verse 17, it says, Then some of his disciples said among themselves, What is this that he says to us? A little while you will not see me, and again a little while you will see me. And what about the second part of his statement? We don't understand that either. When he said, Because I go to the Father. They said, Therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know, the word know is understand, by the way. We do not understand what he is saying. So clearly a lack of understanding by the disciples. Question. Why did the disciples not understand what Jesus was talking about? Well, I think probably for two reasons. First of all, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They won't receive the Holy Spirit till John chapter 20, verse 22, when the Holy Spirit dwells in them. The Holy Spirit won't come upon them until Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the, after the, uh, the Feast of First Fruits. And I think the point for us is simple. Apart from the power and the person of the Holy Spirit in our lives as believers, we really can't have clarity of vision. We can't fully understand spiritual things. In fact, Paul said that the natural man cannot understand the things of God, nor can he know them. They're foolishness to him because they are spiritually discerned. 
I mean, hey, have you ever been talking to a non-believer about Jesus? And they're looking at you like that little puppy, you know, wagging it, turning his head like, what in the world are you talking about? And you're thinking to yourself, you know, this is as simple, so simple. My grandkids get it. Why can't you understand it? What's the problem? Well, they don't have spiritual eyes. They don't have the Holy Spirit to bring the truth of the scriptures to light in their heart. But I think there's a second reason why they lacked understanding. And that's because they had a misconception about the Messiah. You see, the disciples, like Jews in, as a whole during Jesus' time, believed that when the Messiah came, when the Christ appeared, that he would right the wrongs of the world, that he would liberate the Jews from the oppression of Roman occupation, and that he would establish his kingdom on earth, a rule and reign of righteousness. But you know, when Jesus came the first time, he didn't come to free them from the bondage of Rome. No, he came to free them from the bondage of sin. He didn't come to liberate them from Roman oppressions. He came to liberate them from the oppression of sin, death, and hell. Read Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Well, uh, that brings us to a third and final thing in this first section, dealing with the problem of the disciples. And that involves the knowledge regarding the disciples. The knowledge regarding the disciples. Look at verse 19. It says, now Jesus knew he had absolute knowledge that they desired to ask him. And he said to them, are you inquiring among yourselves what I said a little while and you will not see me and, and again a little while and you will see me? Now that of course is a rhetorical question. Jesus didn't ask them that question because he needed an answer. According to verse 19, he had absolute full knowledge of what they were thinking. And I got to tell you, this should scare the far out of all of us. Jesus knew what was in the mind and the heart of the disciples. He knows what we're thinking right now. In fact, some of you are here right now thinking, when is he going to be done? <laughs> you know, we've got big Mother Day plans today. We've got the whole family coming over. And, you know, we really need to get out of here. This is third service after all. Look, I get it. I'm ready to go home. You know, Sally, it is Mother's Day. And, you know, she is such an amazing mom. And my mom, mom, ah, you're the most amazing mom. Bless your heart. She, after all these years, still puts up with me, you know. Clark, do you, do, don't you need a sweater? Look, Mom, I'm almost 60 years old. I, I think I'm okay. I don't need a sweater today. <laughs> But Sally, you know, being Mother's Day and all, she's home now doing the barbecued ribs and the corn on the cob and the baked beans. You know, I mean, bless her. She's the best mom ever. You know, I told her, I think we should have Mother's Day every Sunday. <laughs> but Jesus knows what's in their mind. And what, in fact, in Re Revelation chapter 2, verse 23... Jesus said, I am he who searches the hearts and the mind. In Jeremiah 17, 10, the Lord said, I search the minds and the heart of man. Look, God knows what we're thinking about. He knows what's in our heart. And this should be a wake-up call for all of us because, you know, the truth of the matter is we can pull the wool over our friends and family's eyes pretty easily because they're not that sharp. But, you know, we're not fooling God. We're not getting, in, getting away with anything from him. Hebrews 4.13 says, There's no creature hidden from his sight. <laughs> All things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. Proverbs 15.3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. He sees everyone and everything. Well, back to John chapter 16. Let's come to this second section. We said there were three. We've looked at the problem of the disciples now let's take a look at the promise of joy. The promise of joy. That's in verses 20 through 28. And if the problem of the disciples points to their lack of understanding, the promise of joy points to the cross. Points to the cross. 
Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. And boy, what a joy this is to know that Jesus went to the cross of Calvary to die for our sins, that our sins are forgiven and forgotten. And what great joy that brings. Well, uh, there are three things in this second section we want to look at dealing with the promise of joy. Number one, uh, first of all, a contrast is given about joy. A contrast is given about joy. Look at verses 20 through 23. In verse 20, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. But, here's the contrast, the world will rejoice and you will be sorrowful. But, here's the contrast, your sorrow will be turned into joy. Now back to his statement in verse 16, Jesus said, a little while you will not see me. Speaking of his death, his crucifixion. And when Jesus Christ dies and goes into the grave, they will not see him. Their response is going to be one of weeping and lamenting, one of great sorrow. But the world, in contrast to that, will rejoice. They'll have great joy because they've been trying to kill Jesus all along. But in a little while when they see him again, when he's resurrected, their sorrow will now be turned to joy. They will rejoice in that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, this contrast is illustrated in verse 21. We have a very familiar illustration, which brings us to the part of our Mother's Day message. Look at verse 21. <laughs> A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow, pain, agony, because of the hour has come for her to give birth. But, here's the contrast, as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish, the pain, and the suffering. Really? Why? For joy that a human being has been born into this world. Now here's the Mother's Day message part. It's given to us as an illustration by way of contrast. Picturing the death of Jesus Christ and the disciples. When he died, they mourned. When he was resurrected, they rejoiced. They were full of joy. And so too it is with a mom. Going into labor, the pain, the anguish, the suffering, the sorrow. You know, I'll never forget when Sally was preparing to give birth to Bradley, our firstborn. We were there in Fountain Valley, and she said, Clark, it's time. I'm ready. So we both got into our 1972 Volkswagen camper bus. <laughs> we drove a few miles down Harbor Boulevard to Hogue Hospital there in Newport Beach. We got up to the fifth floor to the maternity ward. And soon as we got up there, Sally went into labor. And she was in labor for two full weeks. Pain and anguish, suffering and sorrow. Two, and let me tell you, the reason it was so painful, from the fifth floor at Hogue Maternity Room, you can look down and see the river jetties in Newport and the waves were cranking. <laughs> Pain and anguish, sorrow. For two full weeks. And then Bradley was born. And the joy, because then I got to go surfing, you see. <laughs> the pain and anguish was over. The suffering had ended. Oh, the joy that he brought when he came. And the waves were still good. So happy Mother's Day. <laughs> 
<laughs> now, this contrast, this contrast is applied. There's an application. Look at verse 22. Here's the application. Therefore, you now have sorrow because I'm going to the cross. You're not going to see me anymore. But I will see you again at the resurrection and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. And in that day, the day you see me resurrected, the day you rejoiced and are full of joy, you will ask me nothing. You're not going to have any questions regarding this statement anymore because you will know fully once I'm resurrected, you won't ask me any questions. What does this mean? A little while and you won't see me. In a little while you will see me. Because when I'm resurrected in John chapter 20, verse 22, I'm going to breathe on you and you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And now you're going to have spiritual understanding and you won't ask me a thing. Now, the context clearly deals with joy. He's using his death, his resurrection, childbirth, women and childbirth as a parallelism, if you will, to convey the application regarding joy. And I think the point for us is very simple. Regardless of what we're dealing with and going through, regardless of what our circumstances and situations may be, man, there's joy. There's joy. And I think it's important we understand the difference between happiness and joy. The word happy or happiness comes from an old English word, happenstance. In other words, if things are going good, I'm happy. If things are going set bad, I'm sad. Follow me? But in God's economy, it's not about happiness. It's about joy. And the joy we have is in the Lord. It's from the Lord. It's because of the Lord. In spite of our situations, in spite of our circumstances, because the truth of the matter is we all go through difficulties in life. We all have ups and downs that we deal with. We all have issues that we're struggling with. But regardless of what's happening in to or around us, man, we've got the joy of the Lord, that goofy Christian grin on our face. Even though everything's falling apart, our whole life's heading south. Man, our hair's on fire and we're just praising God. Because that's the joy that we have in the Lord. Well, number two. The second thing in this second section dealing with the promise of joy involves prayer. Prayer is mentioned regarding joy. In verses 23 through 27, Jesus deals with the fact that prayer is mentioned regarding joy. And I think you might like this. Look at verse 23 again. In John chapter 16, in the middle of verse 23, Jesus switches gears. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, speaking of prayer, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive. Why? That your joy may be full. Now, here he mentions prayer as it pertains to joy. And in this, he talks about praying in his name. Praying in the name of Jesus, which is not something we simply tag at the end of every prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. No, when we're praying in the name of Jesus, we're praying according to who he is and what he is all about. We're praying in light of his character. We're praying in light of his will. Now, there's nothing wrong with asking God for stuff. Lord, I need help. Lord, can you heal me? Lord, can you pay this bill? Lord, can you give me a job? Lord, can you bring the right spouse? Lord, can you deal with this issue? Lord, can you deal with that? There's nothing wrong with asking God for all the issues in our lives. But ultimately, at the end of every prayer, we pray it in the name of Jesus. We pray it according to how Jesus would pray. And the way he prays, according to Luke chapter 22, verse 44, is according to the will of God. Not my will, but your will be done. 
You see, that's praying in Jesus' name. According to John 14, 14, Jesus said, if you ask anything in my name, according to my plan and my purpose, my will, I will do it. And listen, gang, this kind of prayer, according to the end of verse 24, will result in joy. That your joy may be full. Now, don't miss the connection between prayer and joy. Prayer and joy. Why? Because prayer is talking to God. Like if I'm talking to you, I'm in your presence. We're talking. We're together. And when we talk to God, we're in His presence. And the reason that becomes so important is found in Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, where the psalmist says, in your presence is fullness of joy. Yeah. And if we want that full joy in our life, man, it's about communing with God, talking with God, fellowshipping with God, and praying according to God's will. Then we're full of joy. In fact, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, that it's a joy that's inexpressible. I can't even begin to tell you the kind of joy that we'll have in our heart when we're simply relinquishing our will to his will. Get the picture. Because when I'm praying, not my will, but your will be done, in effect, I'm saying, God, do whatever you want to do. I'm saying, Lord, do whatever you have to do in my life to bring my life in line with your will, your wants, your ways. And when that truly is our heart, when we relinquish everything and say, God, <laughs> it's all going to be whatever you want it to be, then God says, right on, my translation. And now we take that step back and come what may in our life, whatever circumstances and situations might come our way, we have joy, the joy of the Lord. Well, in verse 25, this section continues dealing with the fact that prayer is mentioned regarding joy. In verse 25, he says, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. I've used, uh, you know, illustrations and hyperbole up till now, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in a figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. And it'll happen here just in a moment. In that day, verse 26, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you, I shall pray the Father for you. Why? For the Father himself loves you. You can go straight to God because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. Look, when you see me no more, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. When I'm resurrected, you're going to see clearly. You will no longer ask me for anything because I have paved the way for you to pray straight to the Father. It's kind of weird that a lot of groups today don't get that. They say, well, you can't really pray to God. You need to go to this person or that person and pray. You need to let them pray on your behalf. Oh, really? You know, the Bible teaches just the opposite. And then there are those who say, well, I will pray to God for you for a nominal fee. <laughs> hey, are you kidding me? I can go straight to God myself for free because Jesus paved the way. Is it no wonder we read in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16 that we now can come boldly to the throne room of God that we can receive grace and mercy in our time of need. Look, we don't have to have anybody intercede for us. We can crawl right up into the Father's lap and say, Abba, Father. And I say praise God for that. Number three and finally, the third and final point in this second and middle section involves a statement that should bring joy. Number three, a statement that should bring joy. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, Jesus said, I came forth from the Father, I came from heaven, and have come to the world to accomplish my plan. And again, I leave the world and go to the Father. I'm going back to heaven. Now, think about this for a moment. This statement should bring great joy to the disciples. That's what this section is all about, the promise of joy. Why? Because Jesus clearly said where he was from. He's from heaven. 
They know what he was all about on the world. His ministry is now coming to an end. And he proclaims he's going back to the Father, which, of course, is in heaven. All of God's plan for the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, has been manifest, revealed to the disciples. And that should bring great joy to their hearts because now they realize that even his suffering and his death was part of God's plan all along. And you know, that really ministered to my heart. That really blessed me to no end. Because that means that God is in control of everything and everyone all the time. Look, God is on the throne, whether we understand it, agree with it or not. And he is orchestrating everything, Ephesians 1.11, according to the counsel of his will. And when we realize that everything that is happening in, to, or around us is either happening because God made it happen or he has allowed it to happen, we realize that everything is being filtered through the fingertips of God, whether we put it in category good or category bad. Now, all of a sudden, I can take that step back and say, praise the Lord. I can rejoice. I can have great joy knowing that that God is orchestrating everything in our lives. Not only in our lives personally, but in his church corporately and in the world nationally. And you know, as Pastor Tom gave those announcements this morning, we think, wow, God, well, maybe you messed up a little bit. Hey, no, he did not. God is orchestrating everything according to his plan, according to his purpose. In fact, the Bible says that in these last days, evil men and imposters will wax worse and worse. Now, that certainly doesn't mean we throw up our hands and throw in the towel. Doesn't mean we give up. Doesn't mean we quit our jobs, sell our homes, and move to the mountains and sing Kumbaya all day long. Though I'm not opposed to that. It means we stand up and we get busy about the Father's business telling every man, woman, and child about Jesus that we possibly can. Does that mean the whole world's going to turn around? Probably not. Things are going to get worse before they get better. But praise be to God, he is on the throne. And he's orchestrating everything according to his perfect plan. Back to John chapter 16. Is everyone okay? Let's come to the third and final thing we want to look at. We've looked at the problem of the disciples. We've looked at the promise of joy. Now, number three and finally, let's take a look at the person of peace. The person of peace in verses 29 through 33. And if the problem of the disciples points to a lack of understanding and the promise of joy points to the cross, the promise of peace points them to Jesus Christ. And there are three things, and they go rather quickly in this third and final section. Number one, first of all, we have a statement by the disciples. A statement by the disciples. Look at verses 29 and 30. This is amazing. In verse 29, Jesus, or it's, John tells us that his disciples said to him, See, now you are speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Wow, finally. After three and a half years, these guys finally believe that Jesus came from God, that he is the son of God, that he came from the Father, that he was going back to the Father. And their faith is confirmed by the fact that Jesus knew what they were thinking back in verse, seven, verse 19 regarding their, their problem in understanding in verses 17 and 18. But now, now, finally, they believe. Which brings us to a second point. And that involves the question for the disciples. A question for the disciples. In verse 31, and it is really not a question at all. Look at verse 31. Jesus answered them, answered them, do you now believe? 
You say, well, Clark, clearly that's a question. There's a question mark after it. Here, the King James translators did not do us any favors. This sentence is not interrogative. It's not a question. The mood in the Greek grammar is indicative. It's a statement of fact. In addition to that, the word do in verse 31 is the exact same Greek word as believe at the end of verse 31. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus is stating a fact when he is saying, believing, you now believe. He's not questioning if they're believing. He is affirming that they are believers. Believing, you now definitely believe. You say, Clark, are you absolutely sure? Oh, yes. Drop down to verse 6 of chapter 17. Look at verse 6 of chapter 17. Jesus here in chapter 17 is, is praying to the Father. It's his high priestly prayer. And in verse 6, he starts to pray for the disciples, the 11. Look at verse 6. Jesus said, I have manifested or revealed your name, the name of God, to men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Speaking of the 11 disciples. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given to me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you and they have believed that you sent me. Clearly, clearly the disciples at this point believed that Jesus came from the Father and he was going back to the Father. They are believers at this point. There's no question about it. Were they perfect? No. <laughs> Did they mess up all the time? And I got to tell you, that really blessed my heart. Because I believe, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he, he rose from the grave that I might have eternal life. I have absolute faith and belief in the finished work of Christ for my eternal salvation. And yet, I am really messed up. Amen. Okay. <laughs> oh, so are you, by the way, just in case. You... Look, just because we're saved doesn't mean we're perfect. Positionally, yes. Practically, no. But it does mean that as believers, we now realize that when we do stumble, when we do fall, we have an advocate with the Father. Christ is praying on our behalf, saying, Lord, Father God, Clark, he's such a knucklehead, but Lord, he loves you. But Father, he's your child. So you know what? He's forgiven. And what a beautiful point that is. Well, number three and finally, let's wrap this up right here. Let's take a look at the gift offered to the disciples. The gift offered to the disciples. In verses 32 and 33, it's peace. It's peace. In verse 32, he begins this by saying, indeed, the hour is coming, yes, and has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I'm not really alone, because the Father is with me. Now, the hour is coming when they will be Scattered. In fact, it's coming upon them real quickly. It's speaking of the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, all of his disciples were scattered. It was the fulfillment of prophecy, by the way, in Zechariah 13, 7, where it says the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. It, it was realized in Matthew 26, 56, where it says they all fled. Now, in verse 33, he says, but, but these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Now in the world you will have tribulation, but don't worry about it. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
Look, in this world, we will have tribulation. It's a promise in Scripture. But you and I don't have to worry about it. We don't have to freak out regarding it. Because Jesus overcame the world. He overcame sin, death, and hell. So in the world, we will for sure have tribulation. But in Jesus Christ, we will have peace. In fact, Jesus, interestingly enough, he says, in me you may have peace. The peace is there for us. All we have to do is access it in Jesus Christ. Because our peace is not based on our circumstances, just like our joy. No, true peace and true joy is found only in Jesus Christ. In spite of our situations, in spite of our circumstances, there's great peace, there's great rest, there's great joy. In fact, over in John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but my peace I give unto you. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. Man, it's that peace. Philippians 4, 7 says, passes understanding. It guards our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I don't get it. I can't explain it. But I sure am thankful for it. Father, how thankful we are for that great peace You've given each and every one of us, Lord, in the midst of <laughs> the tribulation that is promised. And Lord, how thankful we are for the joy, the rest, the peace we have in you. As your word tells us in Ephesians 2.14 that you are our peace. You are our rest. And Lord, what else can we do? How else could we respond? But to thank you for it to worship you in light of it, to serve you. And that, Lord, we would be busy about your business, telling others about the great peace that is available to them. Help us, Lord, to do that, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you need prayer today for anything at all, after service, the pastors, brothers, sisters, they'll be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, just to serve you, to minister to whatever need there may be in your lives today. And I pray that God will continue to bless each and every one of your hearts. Strengthen your hands, guide your feet, that this would be a, a week like none other as you go forth from here. Man, fall in more in love with Jesus because, family, it is all about Jesus. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, have a great Mother's Day in the Lord.